Thank you. I made my hair extra tall today in honor of Pastor Weaver. But I am super honored and excited to be with you this morning. Uh, like Pastor said, I'm, my name is Pastor Luke. I'm the high school pastor. Um, and uh, before we get started here, I just want to highlight again, you are not going to want to miss out on that marriage weekend. Uh, our speaker, Ted Cunningham, is absolutely hilarious. Uh, but the truths that he presents uh, are so meaningful and impactful. So uh, you will laugh. Uh, you will, I mean, you will cry from laughing and you will cry uh, from his truths. So be there. Uh, make it a point to be there. Also come back tonight. We love celebrating new life in Jesus for baptism. And, and uh, the, the better speaker on this Sunday, Jared Atchison, will be bringing the word tonight. And, and I know God's laid something on his heart. So Make sure to be here, but you can turn uh, to Luke chapter 7. I'm sorry for the doom and gloom outside this morning, uh, but I thought, man, well, how fitting if it's doom and gloom outside this morning, I'll preach some fire and brimstone this morning. Some throwback. Oh, I'm just kidding, I won't do that. But Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Uh, I'm so honored that I get to share what God's doing in my heart and, and the word that he put uh, for this morning. Uh, we're continuing our show up September kind of series. It's been so fun to get to hang out with you, have a little fun on some Sundays because serving Jesus is a ton of fun. And, uh, um, but my topic is faith this morning. And with that topic, it can be so broad uh, or so specific. And I just was really praying, God, uh, really, what, whatever you want this morning, uh, help me to just get out of the way. And I, it, God led me to Luke chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer or a Roman centurion was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come on his behalf and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the Roman. If anyone deserves your help, he does. For he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them, but just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home. For I'm not even worthy of such an honor. I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turn to your neighbor and say amazed. amazed. He was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, Jesus said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. What a statement. What a statement. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Almighty Powerful, says, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. When the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. For your word that's going forth this morning, I thank you that it does not return void. We thank you that it also sets us free. And where your spirit is, there's freedom. And we pray that we just invite you into our hearts in the deepest places, God. Uh, and, and we just give you authority to move how you want to move this morning. We thank you, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. So talking about faith leading to the story, we hear Jesus make this claim, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. That is a statement right there. And I'm thinking, if I'm going to preach on faith, I want to go to a story where Jesus recognizes extraordinary faith, an abundance of faith that we can learn from, from this Roman centurion, this Gentile man. And, and uh, so why did this Roman, why would Jesus say it about this man's faith? about this scenario. We see other scenarios of men and women stepping out in faith, but Jesus doesn't make this claim, nor does he get amazed. And so, just a recap of the story, it, it, uh, 
This, this man has a sick slave whom he cares about. And he rounds up these Jewish leaders. We know he's well respected and liked by the Jewish people, even though he's ruling over them and controlling them. Uh, and so he sends these guys out and he's almost like, hey, talk me up a little bit. Talk me up a little bit to Jesus. Tell him how much I love your people. Tell, t- tell him about that synagogue that I paid for. Tell, t- tell him how, you know, that, that, that he needs, I need him to come and help me. I'm desperate for his help. And, and, and he sends this group there and they, they say this to Jesus. Jesus doesn't even respond. And he starts to follow them. And then another group gets sent out of some of the Romans' friends. And now the tune is kind of switching a little bit from this man's worthy. And the other group says, I'm not worthy at all. Don't even, I'm not even worthy to come to, for you to come to my house. I'm not even worthy to see you face to face, to be in your presence. I'm not even worthy to meet you. And so we, we get a glimpse here of the centurion's heart, of his humble heart. But I know for me, when I'm reading stories in the Bible, I, I always love to insert myself in there to see how maybe figure out how I would respond, and especially in, in the Gospels, I like to insert myself as maybe a disciple walking with Jesus, and oh, how, I would, how, I, how would I respond to Jesus, you know, feeding the 5,000? How would I respond in these situations where they're called to step out in faith? And I'd like to say, like, yeah, no problem. Like, Jesus calls me to walk on the water, I'm there. No problem. I'll, I'll jump out that boat. I like to think that. And I'm silly for thinking that, but putting myself actually in the story is a whole different thing. And I like to think, man, you know, in my life it's so hard to step out in faith now. If, you know, it would be so much easier if Jesus was just right here the whole time, or I could hear him firsthand and see him firsthand doing all these things. I know my faith would be greater if I could see it here. And I use that as an excuse not to step out in faith. And I use the excuse, well, it's harder to step out now because we don't have Jesus in the flesh here. Well, that's wrong. We see that the greatest faith in Israel by this Roman was presented. He had never met Jesus in person, never seen him in person, never, never heard him firsthand, and yet he would audaciously step out and have a faith like that. So we don't have an excuse. We're in the same boat. Saying, yes, Jesus lived and he died. He's at heaven on the right, right hand of God. But he has sent his Holy Spirit. So we're actually, Jesus says we're better off. So we don't have an excuse. We're better off. As we should be with our faith. And so we see the heart of this, this Roman. Almost getting, rounding up this crew and saying, hey, I, I'm not even worthy for this guy to come and heal my my slave, could you, could you just talk me up and me convince him? And we, they say words like, he's worthy, he's deserving of it. Then the next step, he sends more people, and we just see the humility of this man. And, uh, you know, for him to say, I'm not even worthy for you to come, not even worthy for me to meet you. We have to understand that this, look at this Roman centurion for who he is. He, a centurion was in charge of 80 to 100 soldiers, Roman soldiers, the elite. And, and on top of that, he would have had slaves and servants and people that he was in charge of that were other leaders in the region. Now, he was a man that was sent by Rome to, to lead over, keep the peace, and rule over that region of a conquered people group that was less than him. The Jews were less than him. He, he was also in authority backed by the greatest uh, empire the world had seen at that point, which was Rome. He had that backing of Rome. He couldn't be touched. He could not be touched. He was in, in Israel for Israel's sake compared to the Jewish people. There's no comparison. He is absolutely uh, in authority. But we see here that he, 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 he knows authority because he says, hey, I got guys that serve me, but Jesus, you have authority. And, and if, if I know if I say something, they have to do it because I'm an authority. But Jesus, I know that you're an authority. And if you say it, it will be done. And he trusts in the word of God because he, he understands authority and he understands that Jesus is in authority over him. What, what? That's crazy. Why would a Roman centurion with so much power and prestige, we know he has wealth because he paid for a synagogue, why, why would a man like that say, I'm not even worthy to meet a Jewish rabbi of a people that we've conquered and now are ruling over? Doesn't make any sense. 
But we know that this, this man obviously understood a little bit something, a little bit about faith. And I think faith and authority go hand in hand. That true faith is recognizing who is in authority. And he knew that authority was not his in this situation. He knew his place and he knew God's place. And he put Jesus in authority above himself. In verse 9, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turn to your neighbor and say amazed. Now this word amazed, the Greek word for this word amazed is uh, thomazo. I'm probably botching that, sorry. Uh, I'm a youth pastor. I'm a humble man. Uh, But this also means marvel, to marvel at, to be moved to emotion at, amazed by, marveled at. And Jesus, we see in, in Scripture, Jesus only marvels twice or is amazed in this, with this Greek word twice in the Gospels. Twice in Scripture we see Jesus marveling. The other time, Jesus is in his hometown. And if you know the story, he couldn't do miracles in his hometown because of the lack of faith. And it caused Jesus to marvel at the lack of faith. I find that very interesting that the only two times in Scripture that Jesus is amazed or marveled at something has to do with faith, and he could marvel at lack of faith, and he could marvel at the abundance of faith. That's so interesting to me, that I could move and amaze God. That, think about this, the almighty God, creator of the universe, knows everything, the alpha, the omega, the all-powerful. He, Jesus was there at the beginning of time. He's going to be there for all eternity. All po- he knows the innermost depths of my thoughts and my hearts. He has got the power that he was there at creation. I mean, amazing. And yet, someone as so little as I, I have the opportunity that I could amaze a God like that. I could amaze an amazing God with faith or lack of faith. Jesus cares about faith. God cares about your faith. And if Jesus was here this morning, if he was walking this morning physically here and he came to this place, let me ask you this for yourself personally. Would he be amazed at your abundance of faith or would he be amazed at your lack of faith? He's going to marvel either way. What kind of faith would he find? And uh, the key to this Romans faith that we need to apply to us is humility, authority. To have a faith that truly amazes Jesus in a good way is to know our place. Authority is putting Jesus at his place above me and keeping me in my place. I think faith is truly a healthy understanding of what Jesus can do and what I can't. What he can do in certain situations, what he can accomplish, but also what I cannot. And that's what allows me to put him in a place of authority, because I know my limitations, I know I have weakness. Well, duh, we know where our weaknesses are, duh, we know our, where, where we lack, where we fear, where we struggle, we know that. Sometimes those are louder than our strengths. Duh, Pastor Luke, I know my limitations. But sometimes I think with faith and authority, I think our faith is selfish. I think it's vain sometimes. I know mine is sometimes. We think, oh, I need to step out here, and I, uh, my faith will do this and cause this. And subconsciously, I think we get to the level where we think the, the amount that I step out in faith is the amount that God will respond or the equation of my big faith equals big results. And so the results, really, we make it more about ourselves than the actual God who's causing them. And see, Jesus squashes this notion that faith is much more about ourselves than we think. He squashes that by, by a mustard seed. If I were to bring a mustard seed for you this morning and I would hold it in my hand, you wouldn't be able to see it. Even up close, it's hard to see. It's so small. And I believe Jesus said, hey, if you just have this much faith, you can move that mountain. He took the smallest thing that could influence the biggest thing. And why did he do that? Why did he say it like that? Why would he present it? Because truly faith isn't 
as much about us as we think. Jesus was saying small faith, tiny, tiny faith, could produce massive results. How? I will tell you how because it's not about our faith, it's about God's faithfulness. It truly is. Very little faith still means all of God's faithfulness. Do you understand that? Even the smallest step of mustard seed-like step of faith, I still get full access to the power and the faithfulness of God. So it really isn't as much about me. What I can do, the focus isn't on our faith, but truly who we have faith in. We think I I know sometimes I think God is, with my faith, is testing me from heaven, and he's saying, hey, all right, show me what you can do, Luke. Show me that faith. Show me what you can do. And no, faith is truly God saying, step aside. I'll show you what I can do. I got this. See, I can only accomplish in my life what is possible, what is natural. But Jesus, God can accomplish what is impossible. If I can do it in my life, that means God doesn't get to move, nor does he get the glory. I do. And what a natural, mundane, boring life that I think I would live that I'm only going to step out in faith in things that I can control. Everyone else is doing that. The world is doing that. So we would be no different. Think of Peter walking on the water in this scenario, and they're in the boat, and there's a storm going around. Everyone's in, uh, afraid, and Jesus says, come on, Peter, step on out. And Peter takes a, a bold step of faith, and we're like, sweet, that's awesome. But then we rebuke him so quickly when he starts to look left to right, and he gets afraid, and he sinks, and Jesus catches him. But w- what does Jesus say there? He says, oh, Peter, you of little faith. Peter just accomplished through the power of God, something that no human has ever done before, nor will probably ever do ever again. He he now has done and accomplished something by the power of God that only Jesus did. That's pretty powerful, and he did that with little faith. Why? Because it wasn't about him. It was about Jesus and what Jesus can do in his life and in our lives. Could my everyday, mundane opportunities, choices, could those really impact the world around me? Absolutely. Because it's not about me. It's about the God that I serve that wants to include me in his big plan. I'm a youth pastor, so I have to be a little crazy to keep, in, keep up with the whippersnappers. So I'm an adrenaline junkie to the core. I am. I love, I I went skydiving. It was awesome. It was phenomenal. But I like to cliff jump into water. And I'll find any cliffs anywhere. There's a, we used to go in Minnesota a lot. There's some at Lake Red Rock that we've, you know, Pastor Zach and I have gone. Uh, If you want to be entertained, watch Pastor Zach cliff jump. It's It's a riot, so sorry. But I was trying to convince the first service that I think we should get a Speed of Life fundraiser going for Pastor Weaver to get him up on I have little faith that you can fly (laughs) but anyways I I like to cliff jump and you know we climb up these things and I've done everything from 10 feet to almost 65 feet uh, and I just love it I just love the adrenaline I love the how it makes you feel alive but there was one time at Red Rock we were we were cliff jumping and I had jumped off this one normal before but like I said I'm an adrenaline junkie so I thought well Jumping off at normal is great, but I, I would rather backflip off of it. Uh, or I'd rather gainer off of it. If you don't know what a gainer is, you run forward and you take a backflip backwards. So I'm like, I want to backflip off this 45-foot cliff. And so I, I, up, you know, we climb up this, this cliff, and you know, we had spotted everything. We'd been jumping for a little bit, and so I'm going to take it to the next level. And uh, I'm going to get up here. So I get to the edge of this thing, almost like a pride rock-looking thing, and I begin to turn. And I get my, my, my heels off of it, and I'm standing there. I'm like, holy cow. I am 45 feet up, and I'm backwards. Why am I backwards? And, uh, and I'm thinking, oh, man, I, I don't know if I can do this. And it, it reminded me in moments when I bring other people up there, I try to tell them, like, it, like 
help them out a little bit, and I tell them, okay, you could do two things to help you jump off. You could stand on the edge, and all you have to do, it's, ama- it's, a, it's an amazing thing called gravity. All you have to do is you lean 51% and let gravity do its thing. Once you lean 51, not in control anymore, right? That'll help you jump off the cliff. Or I tell them, you take a couple steps back, and you get enough momentum where you can't stop. Then gravity will do its thing again, okay? So I, I forgot in the first service to tell them, uh, I, so I get there and I just have to lean enough, and then gravity does it. I'm, out of, I'm in a place where I'm out of control. I've controlled everything up to that point, but 51%, then I'm in a place where I can no longer control and that end of that specific story, I over-rotated, landed completely horizontal on my back, knocked the wind out of me. It was amazing. But I went back up, and I did it, and I, and I landed right, so I was fine, and I'm, I'm okay, I think. Um, but, but I think there's a, there's a little bit to that. James talks— <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get you up there, big guy. Uh, James—, James talks about uh, and gives us a definition of faith is trusting obedience. And I was able to, in obedience of what I can control, get me to the edge of that cliff, get me to 50%, but the second 51% happens, I'm no longer in control. I believe where faith begins is sometimes where logic ends. I believe where faith begins often is where we lose all control. Not in a sense of I'm out of control, but I don't, I can't control the situation. That's what faith does to us. It puts us into places where we don't have control anymore. But do you know who does? God. Jesus has control. And a lot of times control and comfort are often linked. Why do we want control of our lives? Why do we love to control things, relationships, things going on spiritually, financially? Why? Because we love comfort. We love comfort. We love to be comfortable. I'm comfortable when I've controlled my environment enough to be all right. Think of even the American dream, the value system of America. I'm going to work and do everything I can so I can get to a place of comfort. I'm going to fill my 401. I'm going to load up my raw so when I'm no longer working, I can be comfortable. I think of kids' sports today. It's uncomfortable to lose, so nobody loses. Everybody wins. We we value comfort so much. But a lot of times, most times, that's why God calls it, we call it a comfort zone. He's calling me out of comfort zone with my faith. Why? Because he wants to get you to a place where you give him control. You let him control. Let me ask you this this morning. When is the last time you were in a situation where you needed God to move. Really needed him to move. And, and I think faith a lot of times is, is talked about with, with negative situations going on. And, and that absolutely applies. Where, where I, there is a need, there is a health thing, there is financial, there is something going on. And, and I'm out of control and I need God. I need to give God good control because he's got to move. But I want to challenge us positively, when, when life is pretty good, when's the last time my faith, or I've allowed my faith to truly give God the authority to say, I'm no longer in control of this situation, God, I need you to move. When? I know for me, it's, it's a very challenging question. See, because maybe the spot of my most comfort is the spot of my least faith. Maybe the spot that I've been working so hard to be as comfortable as possible is exactly the place where I, ha- I have all the authority. I'm totally in control. And often God will allow us into situations we can't control because that's the only way we give him control. And having this faith, it's risky. It's risky to, to get 51%. You think of a trust fall. I gotta trust the people that they're gonna catch me. I got to, you know, I'm jumping off that cliff. I got to, I got to, I'm out of control. I'm falling. And it's risky, but I I really believe that God wants it to be risky for our comfort. He wants it to be risky for our plans, our reputations, our weaknesses, our desires, and our fears. He wants to risk those things. 
He wants us to give him authority. And you could say, well, you know, I have all these limitations and, and, and I, you know, but God, I'm, I'm pulling a Moses here and I, you were calling me to speak, I'm not good at it, I, I, this and that. And, and uh, I think sometimes that's, a, that's not a fear issue, that's a pride issue. What do I mean by that? Because it's thinking our limitations could keep God from a miracle or actually keeping God from what he wants to do. We actually think, <laughs> I think, that my limitations are bigger than God. That's pride. That's putting me in authority. As if on our best day we could actually help God do a miracle. Right? The beautiful thing, and this is the gospel in itself, that we are undeserving, we are incapable, but God would choose to allow us and want to include us in his amazing plan. And all he's saying is, hey, give me a little faith and give me control. Just give me authority. Put me in authority and watch me work. Put me in control. Put me in authority. I, uh, back to the adrenaline junkie thing. I didn't share this first service, feeling the need to now. Sometimes it looks like this, and in, in high school, I, you know, we would carpool everywhere trying to save gas, so all, all, the, buddy, all the guys would, would drive together, and I had a, a, a gnarly old Jeep Cherokee, uh, RIP, uh, and uh, we would drive, and often I would drive, or my buddy would drive his, his little Malibu, and it was so dumb, and it's, it's very, it's not good, so don't do this, don't try this at home, but so many times we would be driving, and he would be like, all right, bro, take the wheel. You know, and he'd be driving, and I'd reach over from the passenger, and I have my, my hand on the wheel, and I'd be driving. It was dumb. I know. All, all the parents are like, anxiety. You know, sorry, mom. Uh, I'm alive. But I would do, we would do that, and I think, you know, I had one hand on the wheel. I'm in the passenger seat. Technically, I'm not supposed to be in control, but I need to control. And we do that with our faith. We're like, all right, God, like, I'll go in the passenger seat. You take the wheel. Just kidding. You take the wheel. Or it's riding in a car like the, the kids learning how to drive. Yeah, I'm in the passenger seat. I'm not driving, but I have a brake. Just in case you go a little fast, just in case you're going somewhere I don't want to go, I'm going to hit the brakes. I know I've done that in my face so many times where I'm like, yeah, God, I'll give you. I'll agree with you, God. But the second I start disagreeing with you, eh, let's, let's bring her back here. Let's pump the brakes a little bit, Jesus because I want comfort. You know, I was talking with a student this weekend, talking about faith and his faith, and you know, he said, you know, Pastor Luke, I've stepped out in faith, and my mountains haven't moved. Do I still have faith? Am I not acting in faith? And I was able to respond, you know, what if God didn't want your mountains to move? Would you still give him authority for something that you maybe don't want or uncomfortable in. You know, putting Jesus in authority truly means it's not about my plans or my dreams or my wants, but his. Because, because his are so much better. He can accomplish so much more than I could ever. Worship team, would you come? So this morning, I'm, I just want to challenge you to, to, to lean on him. Do you know in Proverbs Three, you probably know the verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not. Lean not on my own understanding. In all your ways, submit. Give him authority and he will make your path straight. This morning, in any scenario, God is calling you, calling me, calling us to lean on him. To lean to the 51, if you will. That's against my wisdom, against my understanding. I could lean back here in safety and comfort, but I have all the control here, and I'm saying, God, I'm going to lean in past the point of control. I'm going to lean on your will, your understanding. Think of these amazing men in the Bible, like Noah. Stepping on in faith. And it was uncomfortable. 
a lot to do with how people viewed him. Think of people going up and asking him, hey, Noah, what are you building? An ark. What's that? I don't really know. Well, what are you building it for? It's going to rain. What's rain? I don't know, but I'm building it because God told me to do it. He looked crazy. It even says in Scripture that they called him crazy. Think of Abraham packing up his family and his neighbors are coming. Hey, where are you going? Going on a trip? No, we're actually moving. Oh, sweet. Where are you going? You going south? No. Where are you? Uh, we don't know where we're going, actually. God hasn't told us, but he just told us to pack it up. Crazy. Gideon, there's an army against him, and he raises this army in faith. God says, nah, it's a little too much. And so he knocks it all the way down to 300, and Gideon's freaking out, and then God's like, oh, one last thing. Instead of swords, you're going to fight with pots. Crazy. The other side was probably thinking, what in the world? Think of David walking out as a young man against the Goliath. He looked crazy. No armor, not even a sword. Just the word that God had spoke. He looked crazy. See, none of them looked impressive in that moment. They looked crazy. They looked out of control. But God had control because what's called crazy in one season is often called faith in another. It's only crazy until it works. It's only crazy until God moves. And I want to live a life that isn't crazy. I want to live to the full potential that God's calling me, which has nothing to do with my potential, but all to do with Him. I just got to give Him authority. I don't even have to, I don't have to do much. Just let Him have control. And so many times, even in church, we try to look so impressive as we come in. I don't want to respond to an altar call because of what someone may think. And I need to be impressive. And I've heard it said that, you know, God never called us to be impressive. He called us to be effective. And true faith, giving authority is effective. Would you stand all across this place? See, I want to stop trying to impress God or impress others, and I want to start amazing God. I want to start amazing Jesus. I want him to marvel and say, look at that. He gave me control. Let's go. <laughs> Buckle up. One other story in scripture about a crazy man was Jesus. He was countercultural. He was turning things upside down. People called him crazy. People called him demon possessed. And up on that cross, naked, embarrassed, bleeding, dying, he was the least impressive looking person. But let me tell you, he was the most effective person in the history of the world. Jesus knew his authority. He knew it was all about Jesus, or all about God the Father. They called him crazy, but he saved and changed the whole world. What would happen in your life if you truly gave God authority? Whatever compartment he's opening right now in your heart, it could be with finances, it could be with relationships. I don't know what it is, but I know God wants control. Not for the sake of just being a dictator, but he knows better. Would you bow your heads with me? We're about to just sing a song and worship, and the reason we sing is very much putting God in authority. Worship, that's what it is. It's, it's putting God at his place and keeping ours at ours. But let me ask you a couple questions. I feel like God wants to speak to our hearts this morning. What area in your life do you need to let Jesus lead? Do you need to give him authority? Do you need to finally lean on him? Maybe it's some prideful areas of faith, trying to be impressive. Where and what have I been focusing on staying comfortable instead of stepping out? Where have I tr been trying to be impressive instead of truly being effective? Just bow your heads across this place and if you feel like the Holy Spirit was speaking to you, that Jesus was speaking to you about a certain area that applied to you and would say, man, I'm too comfortable or I'm too controlling. Would you just raise your hand and say, yeah, that's, that's an area that I'm going to give God authority. My hand is up. Thank 
you, Jesus. Thank you, God. You can put your hands down. Or if you're in this place and you're sitting there going, man, you know what? I've, I've never really given God authority of my whole life. I've never really accepted him as my savior, recognizing, man, he died for me and I could live for him. If that's you in this place and you would like to make that best decision that you could ever make and follow him with your whole life, would you just raise a hand between you and Jesus? We can pray for you and connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. See your hands, absolutely. Praise God. Yeah, I see your hands. Praise Jesus. Awesome. We're just going to pray over you. And if you made a decision in any certain way, the, uh, we have resources for you. I'll be at the Fresh Start Center right out the back in the lobby there. I want to connect with you, but I'm just so thankful for a God that wants to include us in an amazing life. So Jesus... We give you these compartments of our life, we give you these areas, and we give you our whole lives, and we recognize that you, God, are in authority. You are our authority in everything. No matter if we feel like it, no matter if we don't like it, it doesn't matter, God, we'll serve you, we'll step out. And we thank you, God, that it's not by our might or our strength or our power, but by you, Jesus, and what you did on that cross. We thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to tap into absolutely incredible power through you. And I pray that as we go out this week and this month, that we continue to step out, step out of comfort. Don't run from it. And God, we would amaze you with our faith. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did, what you're doing. Praise you, God, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. We love you, church. I'm excited to see your communities your families, your workplaces, how those will be impacted when we step out in faith. Grab a hug. We bless you today. Have an amazing week. Come back tonight for some baptisms and for Jared preaching.